right. Welcome. Hello. Happy Friday. Uh, what questions do you have about the quiz, the lab, priority queues, or heaps, anything we've been looking at? Atlanta. Sorry, can you say that again? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so each node in the KD tree has a rectangle. Uh, and a way that we can, uh, the, the way to think about this is if this is our space uh, and we have, throw a few nodes in here. A, B, and C. A is the root. It splits the world according to its x-coordinate. C and B are its children, splitting by their y-coordinate. And the rectangles, like each of these nodes has a rectangle that represents the all like the, the region of 2D space where the children of that node could be. And so the root of the tree, its children could be anywhere. And so it will always have, it, like A's rectangle will always be infinity, like positive or negative infinity. The, the minimum X and Y will be negative infinity. The maximum X and Y will be positive infinity. Uh, if you Uh, need to use infinity, you can use the, the double class has kind of static uh, variables, all caps, positive infinity and negative infinity that you can use to, to represent um, those quantities. But the root will have a rectangle that's kind of all possible points. And then it's children, like the points that could be children of B, where could those, like where could those be in our in our two D space. Liam? Uh, the entire right side of the node A. Yeah, the children of B could be anywhere from A's x coordinate off into infinity. So they can't be they can't have an x coordinate less than A, but other than that, B's children could be anywhere. Likewise, C's children can't have an x coordinate that's more than A's x coordinate, but otherwise they can be anywhere. And so the rectangle for each node will be the same as its parent's rectangle, just with one of the four x min, y min, x max, y max different. Uh, one of the four dimensions will be limited by whatever kind of splitting coordinate its parent had. Um, and these rectangles let us uh, easily ask like, say we're looking for the nearest thing to this point, we can ask, uh, is a point contained within a rectangle? We can ask, what is the distance between a point and a rectangle? Which, like, for B's rectangle would be something like this. It would just tell us the closest distance to anywhere in that rectangle. Uh, and if we're doing a range search and we're searching for something within this range, we can ask, does this rectangle intersect? Does it overlap with, say, C's rectangle in any way? And if they don't overlap at all, then we don't need to look anywhere below C in the tree because we can't find anything in this rectangle inside C's rectangle. Uh, so these, like, you, you could implement this KD tree without the rectangles, but you'd have to write a lot of sort of geometry type code yourself instead of using these rectangle methods, which which have which do a lot of these like do rectangles intersect, how far away are they from points, things like that. Does that make sense? Questions on the KD tree rectangles? Other questions to start us off?
All right, let's pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we were talking about a, a new kind of tree, uh, a heap. Uh, so let's kind of get our heads back into heap land uh, by asking, is this tree a valid min heap? We're thinking mostly true. Um, so that's uh, indeed correct. This is a valid min heap. Uh, can someone remind us how, like, what are the properties a min heap has to have? I mean, um, first, the missing nodes have to be from left. I mean, from right to left, so you can have like, let's say, you can have a fifty below the one hundred. That um, the children of every single node has to be smaller. Well, I mean higher than the um, node itself. Exactly. That we have our structure property. We need to have a complete binary tree, and we have our heap property. The root is smaller than all of its descendants, and this sort of applies recursively to each each node of the tree. Uh, uh, is this tree? A valid min heap. All right, we're close to to ninety percent false. That that's correct. This is not uh, this is not a valid heap. What which of our properties does this one violate, Ron? Uh, it's not complete. Yeah, this is not not the right shape for a heap. Uh, we can only be missing nodes kind of from the right. So if there was an, a child here, 50 would have to have both its children. Aiden. So why can't we have a min heap like that? Like, why does it mean complete matter? So uh, we'll see precisely why it matters when we talk about uh, adding and removing. Because uh, adding and removing, we're going to need to have, we're going to need to know a specific spot where we would initially add a new node and a specific spot we would take a node from to replace something we removed. Uh, so uh, if uh, and, and so having it be this complete shape will like. M it's part of how we will like implement adding and removing in an efficient way. So we'll we'll see that momentarily. Last one. Is this a valid min heap? What which of our heap properties is violated here? Seraphine? Uh, it's the heap property where it's like thus. A smaller number has to go on top, so in this case, it's like 15 should be in the position where 20 is. Yes, we have a. Uh, we're not following our our uh, our property where the root has to be has to be smaller than all its children. Does that make sense? Any questions on our heaps here? Okay, so on to. The uh, kind of meat of uh, uh, of the heap. Um, so, can someone remind us what are the operations? Because uh, we we wanted to our, our kind of motivation for the heap was we had this data structure called a priority or abstract data type called a priority queue. Um, can someone remind us what? Our priority queue operations were. Okay. We wanted to be able to remove, like get the minimum thing, and also remove it from from the priority queue. What else? Okay. Is empty. Definitely. 
Harry? Get the minimum. Get the minimum. Very good. Jeffrey? Addy. Oh. And Ann. Yes, these were our four, four operations. So let's think about we have uh, a heap uh, that um, keeps track of, of, say, the root of the heap. Uh, let's look at these middle two. First, to get the minimum, uh, what would we what would we do to get the the minimum value in in our in our heap if that was our what we were using to implement our priority queue? Uh, Paul. Yeah, we would just uh, root dot data or kind of whatever it is that we're storing at the root. That's the minimum thing. So we just return return that, uh, and that's all we need to do. How about is empty? Peter, is the root node is null? Yeah, exactly. We can just check is our root null or not. So these two pretty easy. Um, for our remove min, we're going to, uh, we're still going to have like, the thing that we want to return is still the minimum, um, but we're also going to Once we remove the root, we're now like missing a node there, and we need to, to put we need to get a node at the at the root, and our complete binary tree has exactly one node we can remove, and have it still remain a complete binary tree, and that is the kind of rightmost leaf along the bottom. That's the one that we can remove and kind of keep this tree in the correct kind of shape. And so we want to take that and put it at the root. But then, of course, things may be out of order. That thing, the, the, the node that we moved, the leaf that we moved to the root, uh, not necessarily smaller than all of its descendants. So then we're going to do something called percolate down uh, and to kind of rearrange our tree into the correct shape. Um, Add has a similar step. Where in our complete binary tree, there's exactly one place that we can add a new node and still keep it a complete binary tree. That's kind of the rightmost spot for a leaf along the bottom, or not rightmost. The leftmost open spot along the bottom is the, the spot we can add a node to keep it a complete binary tree. And then we're going to do a similar kind of uh, operation that's called percolate up to make sure that things are, are in the correct order. So that's, that's the terminology. Uh, let's look at an example. So we have the following heap. Mm 
Right, we have our heap here. Follows all the rules uh, that we need to follow to make it a, a min heap. And to remove the minimum, that's at the root. So we're going to return two as the minimum. And this node here, 10, the kind of the rightmost along the bottom, this is the one that we can kind of take away and leave the tree as a complete binary tree. So we take away 10 and we move that up to the root. That's our kind of first steps of, of removal. But now, of course, things are out of order. And so our percolate down is going to be a process of repeatedly swapping a node with the smaller of its two children until it's uh, uh, kind of no longer, um, uh, until we've either reached a leaf or our value is in the correct position, meaning that it's smaller uh, than its children. So starting with 10, I need to swap it with one of its children. Uh, could I swap it with 4 if I wanted to? Why couldn't I swap it with four? Charlie? Um, swap it with a child? Uh, I, I've told you that we should swap it with a smaller child. But let's say that, that I hadn't kind of written this as if it's a uh, uh, rule from, from on high. And I said, well, why can't I put four up here? Peter? Because then you just need to swap four with three, because three can't be below four. Yeah, if, I, if I'm going to move one of the two children up, I know that the, the parent has to be smaller than its children, and so I have to move the smaller one up, because otherwise I'm going to have things out of order. So I swap 10 and 3. Uh, am I in the correct position? Is everything in order? No, so I have to keep kind of percolating down. The idea is that I have something at the root that's sort of in the wrong spot, and I kind of want to have it fall down through my heap until uh, things are, are, are back in order. So now, which value do I need to swap 10 with? That's it? Yeah, that's my smaller child. And now I've hit one of my kind of stopping points. 10 is at a, at a leaf. And so it's by kind of definition smaller than its children, doesn't have any children. Um, and I have kind of restored the heap property. I remove the minimum, which was two. And I'm back to a tree, which is a complete binary tree, and one in which each node is smaller than all of its children. Does that make sense? What are your questions on this? So let's think about the efficiency of this remove min operation. So let's say I have n nodes in my tree. How, how, what is the height of a heap with n nodes? Like how, how kind of, how many levels 
could there be in a heap with n nodes? Could it be like a, a, a linked list? Could it could it have a height of n? No, because that, that would not be a complete binary tree, right? For our complete binary tree, it has to be kind of the full triangle, uh, kind of every level filled out except the bottom one, maybe, which can be missing some on the right. So I can't have it be a linked list. Um, so the height doesn't seem like it would be n. Uh, thoughts on what the, the height of our of a, of a heap with n nodes might be, Brian? Uh, log n? Yeah, why, why are you thinking log n? Um, is you just be cutting off the uh, like half of the, the tree each time you went down with a child layer? Yeah, that we kind of each extra kind of height that we have kind of doubles the number of nodes. Uh, and so uh, n nodes, kind of the, the height is, we start with one node, and then the height's the number of times we can double that until we end up with n. Because each level of our tree is going to be fully filled out. So we know that this, the second level will, if the height is more than uh, uh, one, then the second level will have all two nodes. And if the height's more than two, this level will have all four nodes, and, and so on. So because it has to be a complete binary tree, we know its height is log n. Uh, and so in the worst case, when we're doing this percolate down, how far might we have to kind of, how, how many swaps might we have to do in the worst case? William? Log n. Why would you say kind of worst case log n swaps? Um, instead of being you'd have to go all the way down to a leaf. Yeah, exactly. We might have to start at a root and swap all the way down to a leaf. And the number of nodes to go from the root to a leaf, that's the height. And so in the worst case, we might have to swap a node all the way down from the leaf to the root. And so our removal is going to be big O of log n. Because we might, in the worst case, have to swap all the way down the tree. T. Um, if we're removing the bottom nodes, wouldn't that be greater than all nodes before? So it would be close to the worst case, if not like the worst case for like every situation of this? Um, it might be. But if we removed the min again, 6 would actually uh, not be, uh, it would be in the middle of, of all our nodes. So um, um, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily the worst case. Um, depends, on, depends on the heap. Other questions? All right, so let's think about adding a node. I'm going to say instead of three here, I'm going to imagine that it was instead one that was at the root. Uh, and now I want to add a node with priority two. So where can I add a new node to this tree? that uh, will keep it a complete binary tree. Can I add it over here, child of nine, Shoko? On the right side of five. Yeah, right here is the only spot I can add an additional node and not violate my structure property. It's the only place that an additional node can show up that would keep this a complete binary tree. And so that's where I shall add my new node with two. But now, of course, the heap is no longer in order 
because two is smaller than uh, some of its some of its ancestors. So now we're percolating up, which is swap with the parent, and again until root or we are greater than our parent. So basically swap it up as far as we can. So two smaller than five. Are we done yet? No, we're still, we're still out of order. Two is smaller than four. But now, should we swap two up again? No, it's in, it's in the right spot. And so we have added a new node to our tree and then used this percolate up to restore our heap property, keep things in the appropriate order. And we're back to having a valid uh, min heap. Does that make sense? What questions do you have? All right, how about the efficiency of this? Um, in the worst case, how many swaps might we have to do after we add a new node? Paul? Log in. Why log in? The worst case is if you add one to the very bottom, so the bottom depth, and then it goes all the way up to the yeah, exactly. If we add a new one and we have to swap it all the way up to the root, that's kind of going the full height of the tree, which we know is log n. So that's why our add is also big O log n. So I also, you may remember, said that on average, if we add nodes in a random order, on average, we uh, will have constant time uh, to add them. Uh, because, for example, if we um, uh, were to insert nodes, we could, cert we could definitely insert nodes in such an order, say from the least important to the most important, where after every insertion we have to swap all the way up to the root. So that's why kind of worst case, we still have log n. But if we're inserting them in a random order, kind of on average, uh, we're going to uh, uh, not need to, to swap them very far. Um, uh, Because, uh, like, we'll, we'll, like, if they're random on average, we can, they'll, like, sometimes be in the, in the right place already or only need to swap once. Um, and uh, uh, this can make uh, our, our heaps very, uh, very, very efficient for times where we just care about keeping track of, of which thing is the, is the minimum at, at a given time. There's an algorithm, a sorting algorithm, called heap sort that uses a, uh, a, a, a min heap in order to take some set of things and get them in sorted order. Uh, so I'd like you to uh, take a few minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors, how might you use the operations on our, uh, uh, how might you use like a, uh, maybe a, an unsorted uh, list of things and you have a heap, how would you use that heap to get those things to end up in sorted order? So brainstorm for a few minutes with your neighbors. So let's, let's say that 
rather than starting with an unsorted list of things. What if we already had all those things in a heap? Like we have, we're trying to sort a list of n things. We have a heap with all n things in it. Is there a way we could then get those things in sorted order? I was thinking you could like keep removing the middle but while doing that, like get the data, just don't remove it only. Get the data and put it inside the list. So if you have an unsorted list, you could add it inside a heap, and it would be sort of sorted, and then you would remove it, add it back to the list, and it would be sorted. Uh, that's that's exactly it. That we want to. We're going to add everything into our heap. And then we're going to remove min until empty. As if we, we get the minimum, and then that's removed from the heap, and then we get the minimum again, that's the next smallest thing. That's removed from the heap, get the minimum again, that's the third smallest thing. And so we just keep removing the min, and once the heap is empty, we've got everything out of the heap in order from smallest to largest. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this, for n elements, we have to do uh, a log n remove for each one. So this, this heap sort uh, has our, it's one of our n log n uh, sorting algorithms. There's each of our heap operations that we're doing for all n elements is log n in, in the worst case. Any other questions on, on heaps? All right. So I want to tell you about uh, President Warren G. Harding. Um, in uh, 1920, and of Woodrow Wilson's term, uh, things were not going great uh, in the United States. Uh, the after World War One ended, and kind of spending on war production suddenly stopped. Uh, the U.S. plunged into a deep recession, uh, so the economy was terrible. Uh, there had been uh, this war that killed uh, millions and millions of, of people. There had been the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, there uh, had been a lot of uh, strikes and other unrest in the United States. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson uh, himself was both uh, literally and politically paralyzed. Uh, so uh, Warren Harding ran on a slogan of return to normalcy. Right, we're just going to get things back to normal. Um, he did something which was not uncommon in these days, but was sort of unthinkable now. He ran what was called a front porch campaign, which is he doesn't travel around. He's not giving speeches and holding rallies. He's literally hanging out at home on his front porch and like occasionally like walking out on the porch and giving a statement and like important political people come to his house and like talk to him. And of course, other people in his party are traveling around giving speeches and whatnot, but he's just, you know, chilling at home. Um, and kind of if if president, presidential candidates did that now, uh, they that people would think it was ridiculous, but it was kind of a normal thing uh, in these times. So here's a picture of him kind of from that uh, campaign. I think um, not not many presidents I think have have rocked the bow tie, but Harding was was one of them. Um, I have. Uh, read conservative, uh, a conservative historian who who could not praise Harding enough as uh, one of uh, the only president who has tried, who has actually tried laissez-faire economics and kind of gotten the government out of the way of, of business. I don't know about that. Um, one thing I can say about Harding's administration is that it was famously corrupt. Uh, both his secretary of the treasury and his attorney general were indicted for corruption. Um, Treasury Secretary actually uh, convicted, the Attorney General got off, um, while Harding was not himself 
uh, implicated in, uh, in these corruption scandals. Um, he at the time and is remembered for this like really corrupt administration. Um, and an interesting parallel to Wilson, like Wilson's kind of political fortunes were in trouble and he headed out to the Western US to kind of campaign and try and rally support and that's where he suffered uh, uh, his stroke. Harding heads out to the West to campaign uh, and dies of a heart attack. Uh, so uh, at that point, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, uh, takes over, and that's who uh, we'll hear about next time. All right. So there are uh, one thing that uh, I don't have time to talk about, which uh, if you're interested, uh, there's a lot in the notes on heaps, is that uh, the common way that a heap is represented is not with like a node class and, and left and right children. It's actually just using an array. And the elements of the array uh, are, um, are the, the kind of nodes in, in the heap. Uh, and this turns out to be like uh, a pretty efficient way to implement the heap in practice, particularly because to like be able to jump to kind of the last spot along the bottom. You don't want to have to kind of trace down from the, the root to get there. And so there's this trick where you can use an array and just jump straight there. So if you're curious about that, that's in the notes. Unfortunately, I don't have, don't have time to, uh, to go into the details. Um, so what I want to do with the rest of our time today is to introduce the kind of final uh, major topic of the course. Uh, it's not the final, final topic, um, but it is the, the final major topic, and it will be uh, what uh, uh, it will be what the, the final lab is is about. So, what are we talking about here? Uh, uh, we are talking about the situations where uh, maybe we have. Uh, web pages that uh, link to each other. So we have, um, I have this is uh, the Wikipedia page for uh, Warren G. Harding, uh, maybe links to the Wikipedia page for the White House or the Wikipedia page for the United States. Um, but the United States page doesn't necessarily link back to Harding. So maybe I would put kind of arrows here. Uh, and the United States page uh, links to um, uh, the page for North America, uh, so on and so forth. So this is like web pages that link to each other. Um, if we're thinking about Lab 5 um, and the different classes that you might have implemented for that, uh, there was uh, maybe a text generator class that uh, created a um, that, that would call the um, uh, frequency table constructor uh, and that also called the frequency tables uh, put method and the frequency tables put method called the letter inventory put method um, and so we might also think about kind of the structure of a program where we have different methods calling each other. We could also kind of represent in this sort of circles and, and lines connecting them. Um, maybe a, a, a more straightforward example is uh, what if we have um, uh, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there's uh, uh, a road from Minneapolis, St. Paul to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and roads from both of these to Chicago, uh, and a road from Chicago to Detroit, and Minneapolis also, you can get to uh, Bismarck, uh, North Dakota, uh, and so kind of uh, a map with kind of locations and, and routes connecting them uh, actually has the same sort of uh, uh, we kind of draw it the same way where we have kind of points or locations that have kind of lines connecting them. Um, 
And it turns out there's a tremendous number of, of situations and kinds of data uh, that are nice to represent in this way, where we have kind of locations and or, or uh, nodes, if you will, with uh, uh, edges connecting them. So to give a, uh, some more visual examples, Uh, we might think of a uh, transportation network, like this is the, the London uh, tube map um, uh, that I can now show you, um, where the, the vert the, a vertex or a node on this map is a, is a, a subway stop and the edge are, are kind of di direct routes between them. Um, we could think of a, a social network as uh, the same sort of thing. Uh, where each sort of vertex uh, in this structure is a person and the kind of edge are, are kind of different um, uh, friends or, or other uh, relationships on, on Facebook. Um, there is also, this also shows up uh, when we're thinking about kind of um, biology and, and proteins where we have a bunch of proteins and they uh, interact with some set of other proteins uh, and this is uh, often visualized as this kind of protein-protein interaction network, where again, we have uh, kind of individual points or, or proteins and edges between them indicate some interaction. So these are all examples of a kind of general computer science concept. I say computer science, a mathematician would, would tell you it's a mathematical concept. Um, but either way, it's something called a graph. Uh, and this is not to be confused with uh, a, like a bar chart or, or uh, a kind of a line graph um, that is used to, to kind of, uh, display information in, in, a, in a spreadsheet or, or what have you. Um, but our graph G is going to be represented as a pair of two sets, V and E, where we have a set of vertexes V. Uh, these are also sometimes called nodes. Um, but when we're talking about graphs, it's usually vertexes, but I will use node and, and vertexes interchangeably. I mean the same, same thing. And we have a set of edges, E, where um, our set of vertices is like V1, V2, V3, uh, up to Bn, and then our set of edges E um, uh, is a set of uh, kind of each edge is a pair, like maybe there's um, an edge between some vertex vi and some vertex vj, and then some other vertex i and vertex k, and so on. But our edges are kind of pairs of vertexes that are connected by that edge. So, so an edge is just a pair of kind of uh, uh, points in our graph that are connected. So, uh, I guess questions on on this definition. Does this makes sense. So, yeah, sure. So, like, I guess more for like the graph example, you showed how like there's the direction from like up, like the airport to Chicago. Mm -hmm. For like the social relationship one, is that like pointing a direction, or is that just like a static thing? Yeah, so this is a, a, a great question that are, uh, we can have 
an undirected graph where our edges are always two-way. So, um, uh, for example, the the protein protein interaction network uh, was an undirected graph because uh, if kind of protein A interacts with protein B, then protein B interacts with protein A. There's like there's no like the 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 interaction is always kind of both ways. Um, and uh, this is. In contrast to a directed graph, um, where uh, edges do have a direction, which is not to say that you can't have kind of both directions of an edge, but those would be considered two separate edges. So um, what I mean is that in our undirected graph, uh, the edge V1 to V2 is the same as V2 to V1. Like, if this edge exists in an undirected graph, this one also exists. Kind of edges are always in both directions. For our directed graph, the edge from V1 to V2 does n is not the same, like does not necessarily mean that there is an edge going in the other direction. And uh, my example of that was kind of web pages that, that have links, like just because one web page links to another does not mean there's a link on that page referring to the first one. And so this would be a, a directed graph where Two web pages could link to each other, but it's not necessarily the case. What other questions do you have on, on this definition? All right, so we might ask, uh, is a graph an abstract data type? Like I've talked about um, stacks and queues. Um, uh, and maps and priority queues is these sort of logical uh, ways of structuring data that have some set of operations uh, and distinct from like a, a data structure or some way that we'd actually implement one of these abstract data types. Um, and we could think about a graph as an abstract data type that has uh, operations like is there an edge between these two uh, uh, vertexes? Um, but there's not some kind of set of standard operations that a graph abstract data type would, um, would provide. But instead, there's just lots of times when the way to represent the data we're talking about, whether it's points on a map, links between web pages, whatever it is, it's just useful to represent that as a graph. And so our discussion of graphs, we will talk about how do we actually represent this data. But our main focus for the next several uh, classes will be about different algorithms that we apply to graphs that can answer questions we might ask about, say, what is the fastest route from Bismarck to Detroit? Or um, uh, if we make a graph of CS courses and their prerequisites, kind of what is an order that you would take those courses in that would satisfy kind of all the prerequisite requirements. Kind of different questions that we might ask about data that's represented in a graph. We'll be studying algorithms that take a graph as input and provide some answer as output with less focus on kind of the, uh, uh, with less focus on some uh, like the data structure implementation uh, uh, of the graph itself. All right. I think that is enough for today, so I will let you go. Um, uh, quiz uh, is due tonight. Uh, Lab 5 uh, deadline is quickly approaching next week. 
Uh, so uh, be sure to, to spend some time on that over the next few days so that you have time to, to ask questions. Uh, and have a good weekend. I'll see you Monday.